Amen. Well, last week was a big week, and uh, if you peeked in next door, if you weren't here, if you peeked in next door in the South Worship Center, you'll see it looks a little different today, doesn't it? We made a mess in there, and if you step in there and walk out, you'll make a mess out here, because there's dust all over the place, and we track it all over the place during the week. But uh, I'll tell you, when I left here last week, last week was a work day, and after the, the worship service there in the morning, we all got to have a little bit of food, and then we went back in there, and we got to have a little bit of fun. And some of you had more fun than others. Some of you got to get 21 feet in the air. Some of you didn't want to do that. But I could not shut up when I left here about how many of you stayed and worked and worked hard. In less than four hours, we got everything we wanted to accomplish and more done that day. It was amazing, and it was an encouragement to me as well. We've been working on this project for a while. We're now in the North Worship Center while our South is under construction, and you can see this place looks a little different, doesn't it? It looks a lot better. And I want to thank those of you who have been able to come down here and help us with the project. Those of you that cannot and have given to make that possible, that is a huge help in our church going further faster in this year. So I'm excited about what God is doing. It's been a big week. The contractors started Thursday. We spent the early part of the week trying to get out of their way. We finished that last night getting a few other things out of their way, and uh, we had a crew in here last night working late over in the south and a crew in the north making sure we were ready for today. How many of you, by admission, would raise your hand and say you had a hard time this morning finding your seat? Because <laughs> you didn't know where it was in here, did you? We should have put them all in a circle or something. You would have been really confused. I came into a meeting one time that I let, it was uh, an Awana scholarship camp, and I had, in the mornings, I had just high school, and I let the graduating seniors set up the room. And I came in one day, and they not only had a circle out of all the chairs, they had a spiral. It just started in the middle, and it spiraled out. So if you wanted to sit in the middle, it took you 10 minutes to get there. So we're, we promise we won't do that to you next week. But it's good to be in the north. It's good to see this project coming together. In the north, there's only a couple things, like painting that door that's left in here. And I can't wait until the south is brought back up as well. And you will have the opportunity to help us in that but I couldn't help but notice, now we're going to post some stuff, and we've already posted some, but a couple of people did some time-lapse photography for us, and I don't know if you've seen those, but that looks amazing. They set it up in the back as we were doing all the deconstruction, and all of that stuff was changing so quickly, and it just looks like busy bees, because of course time-lapse, we speed it up, and it's just like people running everywhere, and carpet coming up and scaffolding and all this stuff going on and it was just amazing to watch it and we want to share more of that and that's part of the reason that we want you to be at that dinner next Saturday at five o'clock if you're helping in this church in this ministry in any way or like brother David said this morning want to help I have a whole list of jobs that are not manned at all right now others people are doing them but they also wear about eight different hats and we need people that can say no that's me i own that piece then we want you to come as well but as we were destructing the south last week i couldn't help but notice the sentimentality that was going on and the, the, it's like, I was here when we put this in. 
You remember? A and the memories of this and that and everything over there is going to change a little bit. Just like everything over here changed. But that one's going to be a little more drastic than in here. This was a little bit of a facelift. That's more drastic what's happened over there. The, the stage has already been reframed. If you peek in there, you'll see. And you'll see the, all the work that has gone on this week. They've already prepped the walls for the rock that's going to go up there. It, it's going to look amazing. But at the same time, we think back about all the things that happened in that room. The weddings, the funerals, the services, the baby dedications, the, the somebody getting to the point where they're so broken that they realize their need for a savior. The people that have knelt across the front of that stage and given their life to Christ, the people that have been counseled in the chairs, at the altar, everything that has happened in there, none of that goes away, do they? Those memories last forever. They don't go away. We just keep moving further, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. You know, some of us this week, we were moving slower. After Sunday, admit it, if you're you know, you were sore on Monday. Admit it. If, if you're old, raise your hand, right? That was me. We've been working on this project for a while, and on Sunday, I figured, I got this. And on Monday, I spent most of the day in bed because I was sore running up and down that scaffolding and stuff like that. But none of those go away. None of those memories go away. We just keep doing what God has told us to do. Sometimes change is difficult, isn't it? Sometimes we don't like change. Most times, we don't like change. And then later, it grows on us. And later, we see, well, this was for the best, or that was for the best. And, and even though we might have resisted some sort of change in our life, whether it be our occupation or relationship or family or whatever, what have you, later in life, we see that God had a plan and that he was working in and through us and those around us. And then we come around to seeing what God's plan was, and then we're all in, right? And we're ready for it. And then we, we, we get fixed in that phase or, or season of our life, and then something else changes, and we all of a sudden resist again. Well, wait a minute. I did this. I gave that. I put this. I built this, and then somebody changes it, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, now we're backing up again. God was in control when Brother Galen first pastored this church, and he was in control 55 years later when he retired. He's in control now, and he'll be in control all the way into the future. But people don't like change. Watch this. If you're able and willing, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? I haven't even given you the passage, but I'm going to be in Luke chapter 22 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But we'll get to the 1 Corinthians passage. But in Luke chapter 22, we find Jesus at the Lord's Supper. And we've all seen the artwork and the pictures of Jesus with the disciples at the Lord's Supper just before he goes to the cross. But look at this in this passage. Luke chapter 22 and verse 14. It says, And when the hour came, he reclined at, at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, we're going to talk about that before in just a moment. For I tell you, verse 16, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you for the message that you have for us today in the Lord's Supper. Lord, everything that you instituted that day, everything that it symbolizes your, your broken body, the blood that you poured out and spilled for each and every one of us, that we could have a way to be with you for all of eternity by accepting the free gift of salvation. Lord, we thank you for all of that. Lord, and as we study your word today, I pray that you would just guide us, that you would limit our distractions. Lord, life sometimes comes down around us and, and we just don't know what else to do but worry about life. Lord, I pray that you would just calm our spirits today, that you would soothe our hearts, and that we would be able to focus on you and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now you can be seated. Now, in Luke chapter 22, we find Jesus partaking of the Lord's Supper and celebrating a broken body and, and blood being spilled out that has not yet been broken and not yet been spilled out. Why would he do that? Why would they celebrate something that had not yet happened? And every time I read this passage, you know, normally when we do the Lord's Supper, we always start in 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, Luke chapter 22, the happenings, 1 Corinthians was probably written about six, seven, maybe as much as nine years before the book of Luke. But what happens here in Luke chapter 22 had already taken place some 50 years or so beforehand so it had already taken place but in john it had already taken place in luke this is giving us the account of jesus instituting the lord's supper saying this is how you will use it this is how its purpose for the church it's a gift that jesus left for us the church body and for us those of south park Baptist Church, that we partake of the Lord's Supper in the way that he instituted it here in the example that we see in Luke chapter 22. But did it stay? When we look at Luke 22, we see that, that word before in verse 15, and he lays it out how it should be done. Did it stay that way? Did it stay the way Jesus laid it out? some 50, 60 years earlier, or did it change? You know, just the same way that we have problems with change in our life, sometimes that happens when it comes to Scripture. Sometimes, you know, we grow up a certain way, and then all of a sudden, we because we, we know what Scripture says about that area of our life, and all of a sudden, you know, our priorities change in life, and all of a sudden, we're not following Scripture in the way that we used to follow Scripture. The Bible didn't change. We changed, right? Our relationship with Christ changed. It might be in our relationships or, or how we conduct our business or what we say, or how we treat people. We know what Scripture says about it, and then we might go through a season where we follow that to the T, if you will, not to earn our salvation, but because of our salvation. And then later in life, our priorities change, and all of a sudden we think that we know better than what Scripture is. Do we not see that in our lives today? We do. And do we not see examples of that in Scripture as well? We do. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. The Lord's Supper instituted there in Luke 22 has changed. The meaning has changed. The purpose had changed. They had taken what God had given them as a way of remembering what he had done for us, and they've taken it, and they've made it a festival. They've made it a feast. They've made it like Thanksgiving dinner, you know, where, where diets don't count anymore. 
You know, we, we can diet all year long, but come Thanksgiving, we're going to take a week off, right? And come Christmas, we haven't even recovered for Thanksgiving yet. We take another week off, and then we start back into our diets in January. And in January, we start talking about, well, how much have you lost? And how much have, have, have I lost? And here's where I am, and here's where you are. And, and we find our... our our verbiage changes. I heard it this way. I heard it this way. Uh, well, I'm within a pound of my pre-Thanksgiving weight. <laughs> you ever heard that? Or pre-Christmas weight. You know, when we had our open house at the house for uh, Christmas, we had, um, I don't have a clock on the back wall, so I'm grabbing my phone so we're not still here at 3 o'clock. Okay, so you're going to give me the high sign? He said he's going to mute me when it's, okay. But the, uh, we're trying to figure this north room out. This is our first worship service in here. We, we met in here at midweek this week. But, um, but anyway, what was I saying? I got off. What? Before Christmas, we had our open house. Everybody was at the house. They were coming and going and all of this. And there was one instruction that I was adamant about, that I every time I announced that I told you guys, don't bring nothing, right? And what did you do? You disobeyed, right? You come in with bags, you come in with containers, you come in with cookies and treats, and, and I'm like, no, I'm having the open house, not because I love you, but because I need to get rid of all these sweets I already have. I'm trying to get back on my diet already, right? And y'all just kept bringing more, and I'm still eating them. They're still there. If you want to help me with that, come to my house. But bring nothing. <laughs> Maybe next year you'll listen. No, we've enjoyed all of that, haven't we? But sometimes when change happens, we don't like it. And even the Lord's Supper had changed. Within 50 years, 50 to 60 years of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, it was already looking like an open house, a Thanksgiving dinner, or Christmas dinner, where diets don't count, and it's every man for themselves. And hey, if I get to the cake first, if I get to the pie first, well, then that's your loss, right? This year, I threatened to cut a square out of the center of the pie. That's the best bite of every piece of pie. You understand that, right? The best bite of any piece of pie is the point, right? That's always the first bite. Nobody starts at the back and eats backwards. You don't do that, do you, David? I hope not. <laughs> But you started, if I cut a square out of the middle, guess what? Nobody else gets that bite. And nobody else gets a piece of pie that looks like a piece of pie. So I threatened to do that, but I was nice. I didn't do it. I abused them in other ways, but I didn't do that this year. But I don't know. It's still there. There's still a possibility that I will do it. But we don't like change. We don't like it when we step on the scale, and it has changed normally. Sometimes it's a victory, but normally it's not, and we don't like that change either. Well, here in 1 Corinthians, this has changed. Everything has changed. They had forgotten everything about what Jesus had instituted and the true purpose. And over in 1 Corinthians, J Paul writes here to the church at Corinth, and remember, the Corinthian church was not like the example. They were not like the poster child for this is the way church ought to run. It was totally different. And Paul writes to, to correct them, to bring them back in line with the teachings of Scripture. And he gives them a warning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, God's word says this. Here's the warning that he gave them. Whoever, therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord 
in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, you understand that our sin makes us guilty, right? But when we give our life to Christ, Jesus washes that white as snow, God's word says, where we can no longer be guilty of that. But then it goes on. He says, he says in verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He says, every time you come to the Lord's Supper, you should be able to examine yourself and you should then partake. But he's warning them for a reason. Look at verse 29. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. He says, if you come with the wrong attitude and you come with a heart that's full of sin and non-repentance, he says, then you're bringing judgment on yourself. Look at verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have even died, he says. He says there, there is a consequence to treating this in the way that the first Corinthian church was tre treating this. He says, when you come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, when you come to remember the broken body and the blood that was spilled out for you and I to make a way for us to be with him in heaven one day, he says, you come with the right attitude. You come as an act of worship, not as check in the box, not as what the Corinthian church was doing. It was a meal. Why do you think when we partake of the Lord's Supper here, it's not like, okay, here's a slice of turkey, and here's a big old roll, and here's this. No, it's not a meal. He even tells them earlier, he says, do that at home. They were, they were fighting for who'd be first in line. You know, around here, you know, when we have fellowship meals, I'm not ever the first in line, am I? For the dessert table I am, because you guys still haven't figured it out. The line forms with the food, the meat, the veggies, and that's not where the good stuff is. The good stuff is on a different set of tables, and Julie does that on purpose, I think, just for me, so I can sneak by all of y'all, just kind of shaking hands, oh, good to see you, and then I can sneak my way to first in line at the dessert table right but that's not what the corinthian church was doing they're saying now i can get out the way men and it, it's like ladies first nope it, there was a fist fight just trying to get there and get the food and they treated it like they've been starving it's like it's a big party he says many have even died because of coming to this in that way look at verse 31 but if we judged ourselves that's the examining part that he's talking about in that earlier verse, verse 28. He says, but in verse 31, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged, but when we are judged by the Lord, see, it's easy for us to make excuses, isn't it? It's easy for us on Sunday morning to put on our makeup, to put on our good clothes, and come down here and look like a Christian, look like a believer. That's easy. But what about the rest of the week? See, you can pull the wool over our eyes. You can fake us out. You can disguise yourself the same way that I would be able to if I was in that same attitude. But when the Lord judges us, we don't even get to defend ourselves. When he speaks over there in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Don't you know that will be the end of it? There will be no rebuttal. There will, there will, there will be no, well, I'm going to protest this. I'm going to, you know, appeal to a higher court. There won't be a defense after that. It's just done. That's the judgment. Look at this. He says, but if we, but when we, are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, or the idea there of disciplined is we are disciplined by Him. He leads us, He guides us, so that we may not be condemned 
along with the world. He's talking about those that are unbelievers, those that have, have been exposed to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for us, that he paid the penalty for our sins, that you no longer have to pay that penalty, that all we have to do is trust in him and in him alone for our salvation and accept that free gift that he gave us on Calvary that day. He says, that's all we have to do. And then we've not condemned. Remember, we studied over in the book of John where he talked about, the, the wording was that they were condemned already. We don't have to wait till the end of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about the final judgment and he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. We're not waiting for that moment to see whether or not we are condemned. If we're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we are condemned already. It's already happened. That part has already, that judgment is already on us. The only thing we can do is turn from that. We can change that. We can change our circumstance. We can change our situation by just believing in Jesus. So he warns the church. But why did he have to warn the church? Why did he do that? If you look back, I'm not going to read it for you, but if you look back at verse 17 all the way through verse 22, you'll see what they were doing. And we've already talked about that, that they were just treating it like it was a meal. And the more I get, the better for me. That's kind of the way I treat you guys. Here, here's a better I illustration, okay? The way I treat you guys when there's banana pudding on the dessert table, that's the way they were treating the Lord's Supper. You know, the more I get, the better it is for me. The less you get, the better it is for me. That's the way I treat banana pudding. And if I get to the banana pudding and, you know, it's below halfway, well, then I'm just going to take the serving spoon and the bowl and I'm going to walk around licking the serving spoon and then you won't want it, will you? Well, that's my plan. That's why I do it that way, right? But God says there's a consequence to coming to the table with that kind of attitude. It says here that we need the time that we should be able to examine ourselves. Now, it's been a long time since we've participated in the Lord's Supper with a normal Sunday morning service, but we're going to do that this morning. But we're going to do it the way God instituted it himself. We want our hearts to be right. We want our minds to be right. We want it to be an act of worship, not just, oh, we did this this morning. Check the box. We'll do it again next quarter, whatever. You know, we were going to do this in December, and we changed it. We postponed it. Why? Because we don't want to come to the table in this manner that they were doing in 1 Corinthians. We want it to be an act of worship, and if we do it in December when there are literally 18,000 events happening in that month, then maybe that's not the month that our minds and our hearts are right. And we said, you know what, let's just move that so that we can treat it the way it ought to be treated. And this was scheduled long ago, and it's our first Sunday here in the North Worship Center after its construction phase, I think that's a wonderful thing. That we can participate in the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday in this room. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into upgrading this room and changing it to the point where we can move further faster when we have, we have a funeral that we're going to feed and do next uh, two weeks from now. And we're going to have a brand new space that will not be stained carpet and, and stuff that just is, is a stain on us as a church when it comes to our reputation and how we treat God's house. This is just a building. We understand that. We're the church. But if the building distracts from the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the building is a problem and it needs attention. 
and we're going to be able to show them a new space that will respect the passing of their loved one and one of our church members. So I look forward to that. But we want to approach this in the right way. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give just a few moments of silence. And this is a time for just you. Now, in this time, I want our deacons to make their way to the front and prepare for serving. Um, and we will get to that. But I want even they to take a moment to examine their hearts. And sometimes, you know, when we pray, we just tell God everything we need. I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. I need healing. I need money. I need to win this billion dollar lottery. Right. Sometimes we just need to stop. And listen. And let him show you that he's God. Let him show you what he wants changed, what he's convicting you of. Maybe you just take a moment and you say, Lord, what do you want from me? And then just be silent and let him speak. So in this moment, I want every head bowed and every eye closed, and we're going to prepare for service. So I'd ask that the deacons would come at this time.